Really nice to be here on what unfortunately is our last one for this season, our last one. I don't know that we ever expected there to be this many, but this is weekly webinar number 13, which is unbelievable, isn't it, to think it's been that long. Um, thank you to all of those who've come to every session. I know there are some who have, and it's really, really nice to have you here for the last one. Um, hopefully, you're going to find it useful. Now, I'm going to come back to that start, start, starter. I can't get my words out today. I'm going to come back to that starter slide later on. But um, six word stories I'm going to look at. There was a thread on Twitter recently with um, two word horror stories, actually. Um, so if anybody's got any good ideas for two word horror stories, please pop them into the chat box. And we'll go back to six word stories later on. There's lots of people saying, hi, everyone. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Patricia. Loads of people like, it's going too fast for me. But anyway, um, oh, he jumped. I love it. Yes, I love it. To Michael Gove, yes, excellent, yes. Um, I hope Hi Julie isn't one of the two word horror stories. Autumn term, yes, I'm here, I like it. Good, we're getting some good ideas there. Brilliant, lovely. Okay, language then today is the focus for the final one. Usual agenda here, going to check in in a minute, see how you all are. Share only a couple of online resources this week. Some language resources, main focus on structure today because I haven't covered that much and I know that's often an area where teachers feel um, either perhaps most nervous or perhaps most lacking in, in ideas and resources. Then we'll have a tea break and then there are some shared resources today and then I'll talk you through some support and we can look at what it is we're doing next year. So okay, let's get started. So if I could have the check-in boxes up, what I want to know is what's been the most useful part of our webinars during lockdown? And then a totally separate thing, what one thing will you do differently next year? That doesn't have to be, obviously not as a result of the webinars, but I always start every year, as I indeed do every day sometimes, with something fresh. And I'm usually, I start with, I'm going to have a very neat colour-coded planner. So let's see what you're all going to do. Oh, Sarah says, so many great ideas. Ideas and resources they've liked. Thank you very much. Uh, what will you do differently? More self and peer assessment. Use the blank space idea, good idea. Have more fun. <laughs> I love it, I love that idea. Maintain my organization throughout. Oh gosh, yes, I'm going to do that actually. Yes, I'm gonna start off organized and stay organized all year. Stop talking so much, <laughs> I like it. Oh, love the webinar on diversity, thank you. Um, just while we're on that subject, if you haven't seen the webinar on diversity, we will share the links at the end and you can go to all our webinars actually and diversity is, if somebody can put that, maybe um, put the diversity link up there in the group chat, it would be helpful. Don't overcomplicate. I think that's a really good bit of advice. Oh, good. Those, these webinars have been so, so insightful. Great. OK, lovely. OK, we'll leave it at that then so we can get through enough. Reduce stress by not leaving house cleaning till last minute. <laughs> Excellent. Or just, yeah, absolutely. Either leave it or get a cleaner. I totally agree. Lovely, thank you very much for that. So just to re reiterate, if you haven't been with us before, if you've got anything general to share, pop it in the group chat. If it's something specific to you or something you want a specific answer to um, that's not to do with the webinar, then please put it in the Q&A and somebody from Pearson's will get back to you because they are there in the background as always. Right, just a couple of online things. And if you came to the head of department webinar yesterday, I did share this then. Um, but it's a, just a lovely night. Oh, I've gone too fast. It's a lovely idea. Uh, you click on that link and you can have a customised background to your laptop if indeed you're able to at school or perhaps you could just do it at home. And you can pop your timetable on there on the left hand side, pop a couple of pictures in and a picture in the big frame and maybe put a note on the post-it. So that's really nice actually to um, have something personal and something to cheer you up. Another one. This is from a, um, a lovely guy called James Fitzgibbon and I just shared this because I thought this was a fabulous idea and I've used it in the classroom. So he calls it Highlighter Heads and he's history as you can see um, from the bottom left. But you can do it, I've done it with Jekyll and Hyde faces, so the faces of the characters across the, uh, across the worksheet. And on the left hand side you have a straightforward question like, who is the lawyer? And then on the right hand side, you can expand that out into a more detailed question. It sounds like you could just have the name there, but the pictures just made it so much more fun for the students and they raced to do it, actually. They really enjoyed it. 
So that was just a really good idea. Um, whole punched exercise books. This went down exceptionally well with my head of department yesterday. So if yours was there, you might be doing this next year if you're keen. Uh, there's a video instruction there. We trialed it with a couple of classes at the school I'm at, and it was amazingly successful if you start it at the beginning because it stops all that glue business. And I'm just thinking as well, it might be a really good hack going forward when you're moving around because in the school I'm in, the year groups will have a separate area to start with across the school. So I thought some way of not having resources, if you can indeed do that, or actually if you do, making them easy to manage and easy for students to, um, to navigate and save. One of my top tips when I did an NQT webinar on, when, on Tuesday came from one of a lovely um, girl that I, I work with who has the most amazingly tidy and, 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 in, and wonderfully exciting classroom. And she said, from the very beginning, teach your students to, to regard their exercise book as a valuable object and not somewhere that work goes to die. And I thought that was really good, actually. I start every year wanting to do that. But she has exercise books at the end that can be a complete revision resource for their students. So it's, it's amazing. And that's the way she does it. I um, just wanted to remind you again about Lit Drive. If you haven't investigated it, please do. It's only five pounds and you can get a school membership. There's millions of resources on that. I think at the moment there's, there's nearly, a, a, there's over a couple of thousand. So, um, you know, it, it, it's all there. Oh, I see somebody said about the, um, about the whole punched worksheets, feedback from students who do this is that teachers need to remember to hole punch them, yeah, or carry a hole punch around with you, absolutely. So Lit Drive, yeah, it, it's an excellent source and they have um, CPD as well. So there's loads going on there. It's really well worth a look. Run by a lovely lady called Kat Howard who was on this webinar a couple of weeks ago, who was brilliant. And somebody said, yes, Lit Drive is fab, it is. There's just loads there. And also it's good stuff because there are a team of people that vet everything that goes on there. So it's really, really good stuff. Okay, language resources. So I did say this week that I was going to do more about structure. So that's what I've done. Now, because I do these, I make these webinars at the weekend for the week, the coming week, I'm not able to get copyright for anything reasonably modern. So I've had to go for a 19th century text. OK, so I've gone for a story I really enjoy called The Vendetta, which my students always enjoy. And I use it at Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. So I'm just going to show you a sort of white space idea here for structure. Now, with structure, I think it's really important that we don't front load with what to look for, particularly if it's an area where students are new to it. It's all too easy for to have them looking for things that don't exist in every text and also looking for things that aren't particularly important in that text um, or writing or worse writing about things that are there but they aren't necessarily relevant to that text or to the question they're answering so I like to start without any front loading so no instruction at all on what structure is and I just always start like this and, and this is not a new technique that we've all done it before but it, it just does make structure easier if we look at it this way so we look at a story and, and we look at, um, at parts of it so this would come up OK, as the first part, and then I would we would discuss that. What's happened? Who are the people? What do we know about them? What have we already found out? And then I would bring in another bit. OK, and then we would read that. We would discuss whether that should go before or after the previous bit. And most importantly, why? Now, that bit I've just brought up, if you haven't read the story, is actually the beginning. It starts with uh, this widow living on her own, uh, living with her son in a house that, that kind of hangs on the edge of a cliff. So the next bit I would bring up is this bit. So this is description. And it's interesting here to talk about at what point do we need to know that the house is on the edge of a cliff? Do we need to know it before the quarrel? Do we need to know it after the quarrel? Do we need to know it before we find out that the widow lives uh, alone with her son? And it really is, it, it, what I'm doing here is really sort of valuing students' judgments. I'm getting them to tell me how they think the structure should work and valuing their points about it rather than telling them what to look for and just doing a spotting advice, a spotting technique. So then obviously I would bring the rest of the story in. But what I do do for each part is I do, I do say, well, what, what do we have here? Do we have events? Do we have description? Do we have flashback? 
Do we have zooming in? So what have we got in each chunk that I've cut up and therefore where should it go and how does it work? So they're surreptitiously, I'm creeping in the technology that they need to write an answer, but I'm doing it stealthily. And also I'm doing it without, I'm, I'm getting them to tell me and then giving them the correct um, terminology for it if they need it. So then I would bring the rest of the story in like that. Okay. I'm going to go back and show you the whole story, but it's, it's, it's easy to find the vendetta and it's, it's a really great story of revenge. It's a good one to use for NXL st students because in 19th century, it is quite spare in its language and it, it really only has that one descriptive passage there that's on the right hand side. The rest of it is very, is very blunt and to the point and quite gruesome actually. Um, so it's a, it's a good one to look at for what can we look for if there's no descriptive language is a good one to look at okay so that's that that is getting kind of the intro to structure down and, and as I say it's asking them how they think it would work obviously you can give that cut up they can put it in the right order they can decide where it goes they can storyboard it there's all sorts of things they can do um, I will Sarah I will find the name of the author in a second it's just for a moment escaped me and I will I will find that and put it into the chat if anybody knows the author then please um, let me know it's called The Vendetta I'll find it and put it in the chat for you so then we need to get into more um, the nitty-gritty of structure so we need to get into sentences now if you're with AQA sentences may sit with the language and the language part of, because you separate it in Edexcel language structure is, is, is held together um, thank you for that, Sam, for putting the name in. Um, language and structure is dealt with together for uh, Edexcel. But either way, we need to think about sentences. And they are notoriously handled very badly. Students will just say a multi-clause sentence is used to make it sound serious or a multi-clause sentence is used to get lots of detail in. So how do we get them to kind of throttle back on the technology a little bit and get more about the effect? So I've used this kind of technique. So here is, if you like, the turning point of the story, the key sentence. So it's one evening after a quarrel. Antoine Savarini was treacherously slain by a knife thrust from Ricola Nicholas Ravalati, who got away to Sardinia the same night. I do apologise for my Italian um, accent there. My Italian pronunciation isn't great. So we've got there three different clauses. So what, having read that, what I'd then do is take those clauses away and say now, or I would ask the students, which part of that sentence is the most important part? Which part can't we do without? And it is the, the, the slaying with a knife thrust. What do we know there? Could we just know that? And then you can bring in the other clauses, probably separately, but I've put them up together and say, OK, what do we now know? What, what do they, why has the author put those clauses in? In other words, what do they tell us? So we find out from the first one, one evening after a quarrel, that in fact there's history between these two possibly. So you think about, you can do some inferential work there on, on the whole idea. We can write a backstory there. When was the quarrel? What does, what does quarrel suggest? Um, maybe it was a, it was a righteous, um, you know, maybe he killed him in self-defense. Maybe, maybe there, was, there was bad blood there. Maybe Antoine had done something in the past that meant that Nicholas um, wanted revenge, all sorts of things. And the second one, obviously, who got away to Sardinia the same night? So we know now that he obviously is to be blamed for it and that he is, it, he, he's fleed the area. So what happens after that? Okay, so we, could, we, that, we know that extra information. So then what I would do is to give them some options about how to answer the question. So here we've got some. Some of these are useful. Some of these are classic exam responses that, in fact, tells us, tell us nothing. So the writer uses a long sentence to tell the reader a lot of information. That's no points. The writer uses a multi-clause sentence as a subordinate clause as that important information. Now we know the terminology, but we're still no nearer. We're just feature spotting. The writer adds a clause at the beginning to build a picture of the two people. Now we're better, OK? Now we're better. We know why he's actually put it there. Uh, the extra clauses add to the tension as they help to describe the people involved. Great. Now we know why we need to know about the people. OK, so we're getting much better. The sentences are long and complicated and help to raise the tension. No, we're going backwards because that doesn't help us. So I would show the students those sentences. I would probably have quite a few more ideas actually around that. 
and I would maybe give them one each and get them to tell me why it is that their their answer is good or bad, or I'd get them to rank them. But I found that much more useful than telling them how sentences work and then getting them to apply it to another one. They found that very difficult. What this shows them quite clearly is it's the reason, it's the effect that is the most important thing. So that's a, a, a useful way of, do, of dealing with sentences. And then we could, now we've looked at a long sentence, we could now move it to short sentences. There are actually only a couple of short sentences in the whole first part of the story. So she lived there alone with her son Antoine and their bitch Semelanti, a large, thin animal with long, shaggy hair of the sheepdog breed. The young man used her for hunting. So you think how much more we know from that short sentence, how much of a loaded sentence it is, the whole idea of hunting, and what a contrast hunting is with the sheepdog that comes in the sentence before. So you can bring in other ideas there like contrast, okay? Um, and you could just use that first sentence before you bring in the young man used her for hunting. And you could say to them, the, the young man has this dog. I'm going to tell you now that the next sentence is about how he uses the dog for going out hunting. Should we do a short sentence or do you think it will be another long multi-clause sentence? What would be most effective? And then you can bring it in. So every time you're valuing their judgment, you're valuing they're bringing something to the party rather than being told. Then the next one is after he's died. Um, the young man lying on his back, clad in his thick serge coat with a hole torn across the front, looked as though he slept. But everywhere there was blood. On the shirt, torn off for the first hasty dressing, on his waistcoat, on his breeches, on his face, on his hands. Just think about how wonderful that sentence is. It's a wonderful story. The more you look, every time I look at it, I find something else to talk about in terms of sentence structure and, and just how cleverly it's put together. And then you have that final one, clots of blood had congealed in his beard and in his hair. Would it be better without and in his hair? Would it be better just as clots of blood had congealed? So it's th those discussions all the time about why the writer has done it how he has and talking about it without the terminology, but actually talking about the effect of it the whole time. Karen says, do you have the questions that you were asking listed anywhere? No, I don't. I'm just saying them as... Sorry, I don't know. I just have them. I just I'm just demonstrating to you the kinds of questions you can ask. Uh, I don't have a worksheet with it. I tend not to because I want it to be an organic process and build on what they say. So it really is about building and, and building up their confidence and then building on each response you get from them and getting and, and what you can do. I often have a list on the board. I might now be writing a list of, of reasons for sentences. OK reasons why sentences work okay on the other side so they've got some some ideas to, to look at on the next one and then I would let them have a go on their own but what I would probably do with this is I would say we're going to read the rest of the story now could you find another example where the writer follows a long sentence with a shorter one and talk about the effect of that so you find the next extract for me and again involving them the whole time just moving away from this story again, I've got another example of the sentences idea. And this isn't mine. This is um, this came from a colleague of mine, Martin, who you probably remember who used to do the networks. So this is a Charles Dickens story. OK. And we don't need to read it, but it, it, there's a lot going on here because there's lists, there's dialogue. There's an awful lot happening here. There's two lots of lists. There's short sentences at the end. There's all sorts. And then you give them something like that. And you would, I would maybe cut them up or give them as a list. You can do either, but they tick or cross according to whether they think it's actually a useful comment to make about it. So the sentences are long and complicated. It, that's just feature spotting. Can we do anything with it? We go back and look at it. We decide we might be able to expand that comment or we can it. So I'd go through each one in turn and say, which one of which ones of these ideas can I can we build on? Because none of them are top level. And which ones do we just can because they don't do anything for us? Which ones are helpful? OK. And then what Martin did originally with this was he used it for writing as well. Once they've decided which ones are helpful in the same way as with what I just said, with that one there, we can um, we can ask them to have a go themselves. So we can say, OK, let you have a go now. So build it straight into their writing. Could you write a long sentence? and then a short one that changes the effect or creates a contract. 
So you're constantly just re- they're doing it, and when they're doing it, they're they're reinforcing their ability to read it again. Okay, so that's that one. So that's sentences. So I hope that's helpful. If anybody's got any comments on that, please do tell me or tell me how else you do it while I just finish my coffee. Which has, as always, gone cold. Um, Anita says, for AQA, we tend to look at sentence structure as language. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. And the structure question, which is separate on its own. Yeah. But that's that's fine. But you can still, the sentence is still... still um, follows i love the discursive approach you take julie yeah i do i do i do i like to i don't like to give out lists of things i like to feed on what they say and build on it and just constantly reinforce that the ideas have come from them i'm steering them in the right way and then give back to them the tools to write it up when they when they feel confident to write it rather than all that's happening otherwise is i felt i was just giving them things to spot which even if they weren't relevant, they wrote about them anyway, or they couldn't find anything. They would just say, there's no language in this, or there's no structure in this myth. So this way, they're, they, they're looking at it um, and thinking for themselves. Um, great idea, being able to use it to create your own, yeah. Essentially using the text as a model for them to use. Yeah, absolutely, which is what we should be doing. Yeah, yeah. This approach is much more stimulating I think for the students it is it's much it's much better it, it makes them feel valued it's a bit scary to start with because they feel as if they've got nothing to look for and they're a bit lost and on their own but once it gets going and once they get the confidence then I use a lot of these techniques and they do work they do pay dividends after a while okay love this approach thank you oh thank you for saying so thank you okay another way you can use it this is um excuse me Hopefully I've got something in my eye that's been there for the last 10 minutes. I hope it's going to come out. Um, this is a story in its entirety. Now, it starts there at the top and goes round clockwise, okay? It isn't that, sorry, it isn't the whole story. This is the extract in its entirety, okay? And it really is worth looking at and reading the end because the end, uh, the mother takes revenge, and it's really quite satisfying, actually. Now, this is a t something I would do then with with um, uh, a higher set is select a paragraph and write an exam style language and structure question. Uh, I used to always do that with top sets and not for weaker students, but I've started doing it with weaker students when I've chopped it up like this. And they really liked the idea of I, I feel confident with this with this paragraph. I feel I could write a question and use it. So you're giving them a way of feeling confident because if you like, they're choosing the extract that they do a question on. But what is interesting with this is I've put the turning point for the story in the bottom right hand corner. OK, obviously, it's the, it's the death. Now, if you were to use this approach for structure, what I've done here is. Look at each box separately and say, what do we find out and why did the writer do it? So, for instance, he starts off with she lives on her own and then he gives you a really detailed description about where, where the house is. Why do that? And if you think about how many texts there are where they put a bit of description in. Why do they do that? Why do you need to know that? Why not get straight to the story? What comes before and after the turning point? I saw something brilliant recently about um, teaching poetry through turning points or teaching, um, writing an essay through the turning point of a, po of a poem. And I thought, well, it sometimes works just as well through stories. You know, what is the turning point? And obviously here it's the, it's the killing because after, at that, after, after that point, the, the mother decides to take revenge and uh, the dog is involved but yes i agree it is this is much less overwhelming for them so that's something that i've done and i think it, it has actually worked better now with underconfident weaker students than it has with the with the more confident ones because they just go oh yeah i'm writing this question i've done this before whereas weaker students go oh i've got a choice and if they go for the little one you know the bottom right not a problem they can still talk about the sentence they can talk about the word treacherously they can talk about the word slain there's loads they can do as i'm going to show you in a moment so i'm glad you like that and oh scott says this could work really well with evaluation well funny you should say that because here we go here we go we are going into evaluation questions here's an ed, ed excel style one how does the writer create tension or a mood of revenge so there's two ideas so how does he do it well, you can see quite clearly there he creates tension by the turning point, by building up to the turning point and then 
describing the body. So there's that big build up and that, and then that gory bit with the body. Okay. How does he create a mood of revenge? Well, it's the dog. He mentions the dog. The young man used the dog for hunting. That kind of idea. So you've already got, as a reader, you've got that idea in your mind. Sheep dog used for hunting. Ooh, there's a contrast there. So there's all sorts going on. But we're doing it from the story here, not from feature spotting or, or, or any fancy techniques. We're actually doing what we should be doing, which is loving the story and enjoying it. And this was a, a, a more AQA style. When I read this, I felt enormous sympathy for the widow. How far do you agree? Okay. Some people, I've asked students that, and they don't feel necessarily that um, sympathetic for her because they think that her son was a badon who kept a dog for hunting and possibly deserved to die. So it's an interesting one. So, yeah, um, it does work very well for evaluation. Okay, another quick trick to end on with this story, and then we are nearly... If, if you've been on my webinars before, you'll know what a fan I am of Because But So, which comes from a book called The Writing Revolution, which is interesting in itself for writing. But Because But So has been one of the most successful things I have used, particularly with nurture groups, with small groups who struggle with getting their ideas out. It has been a real game changer for developing their ideas and in writing for, for developing their written responses as well. So it's worked for reading and for writing. So I've used it here. One evening after a quarrel, we're back to that same turning point again. So I would show them this. The tension is at its height when, so they have to tell me when it's at its height. The tension is at its height when he is treacherously slain because, why is that tense? The tension is at its height when he is slain because you wonder what's gonna happen next and readers would be on tenter hooks. But they might already know because he's got the hunting dog, yeah? Um, or the tension is at its height, height when he's treacherously slain. So what might readers feel? What knowledge might they already have? So, you know, the, the because, but so, using them there, um, either separately or, or as a paragraph. And it really develops their ideas and gets them thinking. And I often give somebody in the class the because, somebody the but, and somebody the so. And so they, they, they then talk to me. It's a double whammy because they talked to me about which one was most useful. Well, actually, for that one, the but was really useful. Or oh, actually, the so helped because I was able to then talk about this idea. So not, you know, at the start with because but so, they would do it for every activity, all three. But then what I've started to do is to do them and then talk about which one was the most useful for discussing their ideas. So they've got an armory then to write up, which isn't a P paragraph or, or something threatening. It's literally just a word that gives them a way into something. And then I would expand that into language analysis. And I would ask these kind of questions. So rather than what does quarrel suggest? Again, for weaker students, that's quite threatening because they might just say, well, a quarrel is an argument. Well, what's the difference between a quarrel and an argument? Um, what would you call it? How, where does disagreement rank with quarrel and argument? So why quarrel? I always find quarrel is quite an old fashioned word. I'm interested to know what you think that the word quarrel suggests actually. How would the mood change if hideously was used instead of treacherously? And what about knife thrust? Would just knife be as effective? What about a man instead of naming him? Yeah, what about slain by a knife thrust from a man who got away to Sardinia the same night? Why have we named him? So names, are, again, it's, it's important. Are people named or are pronouns used? It's really, it's really um, an interesting way to look at it. So comments on that would be interesting, but it has been very useful. So that really was my structure, but in terms of reading, but there, there was just another thing I wanted to do that also um, covers structure in a way, and that's going back to the starter activity I did with the six word sentences. So here's probably the most famous which I'm sure you've seen, the little cries to anybody who knows who apparently wrote this as a bet, I think, in a bar one night, challenge to write a short story. It is, it's Hemingway, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was reading actually yesterday, though, that, that somebody isn't sure whether it was him, but I like to think it is. Um, so the differences between those, and look at how many different ways you can write it and which works and which means more than another, which is the most sad which is the 
most effective. Okay. And I've done this in many ways. It, it helps them to discuss. It's a really good way of, of teaching um, colons or indeed semicolons, if you want to, in a practical way. What's the difference between never worn baby shoes with a semicolon and never worn baby shoes with a colon? What's the difference? You can get so much out of this. Another thing I've done is I've used, not necessarily used this, and I must admit, I don't know that I would in the classroom, but this was just for your benefit. But I have used six word horror stories that they've written and they write one and then the next person has to expand it. OK, so they have to write the before and the after. So it's a bit like sentence consequences. Somebody writes their six word story and then they pass it on to the next person and they get the next person's and they have to write. What do you think happened before those six words? And then they pass it on again and the next person writes the, what happened afterwards. And so that way you expand the story. out. It's really great. It's a really fun idea, actually. And it's a really um, I find the students absolutely um, loved it because they liked reading everybody else's six word horror stories. And I showed them lots of examples and we talked about what works and what didn't. And there are quite a few examples if you Google um, six word horror stories or indeed it could be six word love stories. It doesn't have to be horror. But I just happen to find the horror stories online. Um, so it's a really good way of, um, of expanding a story. But it's also a really, really good way of teaching sentence punctuation. And with brighter students, I might just give them the words in any order in a circle and say, I, I need some punctuation. What would you put in and why? And it really gets them to think about when I use it, I have to think about this. Therefore, when I see it, I need to think about what I would do with it. And I found that a useful way to talk about sentence analysis and, and, and punctuation analysis is instead of telling me what semicolons do uh, or telling me what multi-clause sentences there are, why don't you tell me what it is you have to think when you use one? Why would you use one? And why would you use a semicolon? So is the, is the um, writer doing what you would do? Okay. It is for sale, baby shoes never worn is the original one. OK, so I hope that was useful. Um, just a couple of things then to end with. Before I give you a quick quiz. Um, so Jenny says, great, thank you. I'm pleased you like that. Now, I go to an awful lot of or used to when, when we were allowed out and, or allowed into schools. I used to do a lot of work with FE colleges. And I went to one that, who, where they said, I they needed to teach people for various reasons who perhaps only came to them for a four week block. And so they said, do you have any way of teaching in that style so that they don't miss anything? So I came up with this two week teaching cycle that I have used myself. And I did it on a topic basis. I actually did it for key stage three, but it does work for key stage four as well. So. In this two week cycle, I would pick a topic and the one I did at the time, the first one I did was sharks. So instead of teaching paper two, question three or whatever, I taught, weirdly as it sounds, sharks for four weeks. But in that four weeks, we did every skill on the reading paper that assumes two lessons per week. Uh, but we actually learned something and we talked about sharks and we did a little project on it. And then I tried this with um, only briefly, but I tried this with. Um, from Christmas to March, unfortunately, obviously, we, we had to stop teaching um, with a year 10 language group. And it worked really, really well, actually. And they chose the topic for the second one, which meant I had to go away and find the, the texts. But the idea is that you introduce the topic in week one. You have images and questions as starters. Then you start to learn how to read a text. You do some writing, etc. Um, and then you move on to language and structure focus in week two and then evaluation in week three and comparison in week four. And each time you do the four week cycle, you up the ante on um, on the uh, their ability, on their um, on their skill. OK, so they get, it gets more and more complicated as it goes on. But I found it work, it was working really well. I was on my third project when when um, lockdown started. And it was the kids said they they way preferred it to flogging language to death for like four weeks and then doing an exam question. It was like, oh, I really like this idea of of doing a topic, you know, and, and obviously you can pick as weird and wonderful topics as you like. The next one I was going to do actually was going to be uh, based on um, space and it was going to be Star Wars themed. Um, and I had I used to I used reviews, I used articles, I used reports, everything like that. Um, 
somebody said it would be useful for reset groups in school. It is. It's fabulous for reset groups. And that's why the um, college wanted it, because they wanted something where if they could only grab somebody for four weeks, they could make a difference. And this worked really well for that. But it's just an idea, actually, that we don't um, really think of, of, of the language paper, which can be a bit dry and dusty in if you just use exam paper styles. But we don't think of it in terms of topics. But there's, there's a, a lot of interesting topics that you could bring in there and cover for a week. And it's also good for the students to bring in their own um, their own texts. So that was that idea. And just a couple more. So that, that really actually, for this session, is the end of my resources. I just wanted to share this with you. This is something that I bring out, and I'm sure you've all seen it before. It's for the students who never answer the question, who never read the question. OK, so it's the old test of do not complete instructions two to nine. You've reached the end of the text, OK? So, um, and while I read your comments, I'm going to leave you to this section before we go into breakout groups with a little quiz. OK, let's see who can get all five, five questions. Here you go. What book was originally going to be called Something That Happened? Which novel is best summed up in this sentence? Everyone is sad. It snows. Now, number three, I, I've never been able to do. Now, number three, actually, three, four, and five came from on an old 11 plus exact, uh, paper from the 70s. And I can't do number three. And I'm unfortunately, I'm, I'm ever so sorry, but I've lost the answer. So I was hoping you can help. Number four, I know. Number five, I know. So let's see. Does anybody know what book was originally? It's really easy, you English teachers. On plan and motor. Oh, that easy. Oh, well done. Well done, Nicola. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Anybody know which bit was which book was originally called going to be called something that happened? I could give you a clue on that. Anybody on number four? Yes, it was. It was a mice and men, yeah. Yeah, well done, Nicola. I'm really I'm really pleased you've got that. Um, one isn't the curious incident. No, in fact, closer to home. I'll give you a clue. Closer to home, but yet far away now, as English teachers. It's not key stage three. It is now, though. That's a clue. Yes, it is of mice and men. Well done. Yeah. What about everyone is sad it snows? Big book. Russian. No, it's not Dr. Chicago, although it fits that. It could fit that, actually. It wasn't that. It's War and Peace, yeah, War and Peace. Um, what about number four? Anybody got number four? Or five? Number four is a collection of letters. They have to stay in the same order. But for one answer, they are all together as one word. And in the other two answers, they are separated into two words. No, I'm going to have to move on anyway. I will tell you. One more. No, what the islands and the letter T have in common, the answer is um, they're all surrounded by, both surrounded by water. And the word that fits in the sentence in number four, and I've used this in the classroom several times, and it amuses students for ages. It is um, the notable doctor was not able to operate because he had no table. Okay, thank you. We are going to go into breakout groups now. And your questions are, your best ideas for a flexible curriculum, because I think flexibility is going to be the, the watchword. Flexibility and resilience, possibly, uh, are our watchwords for September. That's one thing. And also, your one best teaching hack. If you only could tell everybody one thing that could change their lives in, um, in September, what would it be? OK, so can we go to breakout rooms, please?
Hello, ladies. Hello. I've, I've just got to share this this hack that is cheeky and funny, but could say, I just think it's marvellous. Somebody suggested, right, that when your glue sticks have run out, save a couple of the lids. What a blinder that is. So that then when you've got I that know. blooming glue stick with no lid, you've got a spare one. And I also, I, what I love about that is, the student who goes, yeah, yeah, there's no top on my glue stick. And you can go, no problem. I have a spare here. Love it. His <laughs> one made earlier. Yeah, that, yeah. That was, yeah. I can't remember who it was and I, because I didn't see their name. It went by so quickly. But please put your name in the group chat and say that was my idea. I think it was Sarah. Yeah, well yeah. done, Sarah. I think I'm the hack of the week, unless you can beat that, ladies. Uh, oh, there's <laughs> one more. From mine was a good. It was just in terms of the flexible curriculum. There were lots of ideas about that, but one was to um, do a lot more pre-reading. So maybe cover context through pre-reading activities rather than actually using classroom mm. time for that. I think might be useful. What yeah. about you, Liz? What did you find? Um, so the hacks. Um, we had quite a few hacks. We've got Steeping Plan. Yep. Um, Lit Drive and Twitter, which we've mentioned a lot. I know you've mentioned those using humour, videos for revision, and using articles online to support any further reading and literary study. Yes. And then for our, and I had Becky in my room, which was good, and she said they are not using the term catch-up curriculum there because that sounds negative. They're going to call it yes. boost. They're calling it a boost. I like it. Oh, that, that sounds good. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, that sounds good. Oh, somebody says same with whiteboard pen lids. Oh, it's changed my life. Sarah yeah. and Jenny have changed my life. In fact, I want to go out now and buy some glue sticks and whiteboard pens just so I can save the lids. I'm excited <laughs> about that. Pam, what did you have? Well, I don't know if mine's as exciting as glue, glue stick lids, I'm sure. I don't but, think um, anything is. No, I know. Well, I'll try and follow that. But Anita was saying about watching films for structure, which I yeah, thought was good. Idea. Um, Sarah was saying about mixing lit and language together, so you know how you can teach the English questions through yeah, literature yeah, text, yeah. which I thought is yeah. Um, then editing together, um, so I think I can't remember if it's Saida or somebody else, because there's lots of good points in there, was saying about um, how now what they're doing is editing schemes of work and resources together, you know, in a shared drive, whether it's Google Drive or OneDrive or whatever it is. So that's good. That's something I think that's more come out of a lockdown now. People are doing that more, aren't they? Um, visualizer was mentioned like and a couple of you weren't sure talked about a visualizer and how useful they are for modeling things, etc. And finally, Mr. Bruff came up as a hack because he does have his poetry videos, which are great for revising. So yeah, there's lots of really good ideas in it there. Sounds to be like honest. Thank you. Well, thank you to everybody. And I think you're staying with us, aren't you, Pam? And then you, you're, 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 are you staying with us as well, Liz? Are you joining us at the end again? I'll stay with you. That's the last one. I just want to do a few thank yous at the end. Okay, well, let's right. just go through. I think you're on now, Pam, aren't you? Yeah. I don't know. Am I probably? Um, Sam was just saying how the whole school invested in visualizers. I think that's good. They kind of died to death, but they've come back again. They have, now, yeah, they? they have. I've never had one, unfortunately, that works successfully, but I would love to because I think they're amazing. Well... Yeah, the mind used to keep getting a bit terrorised or whatever the word is when I was out of the room sometimes. But yeah, in general, they're good. Right, do you want to move on? Right. Yeah, if you want to, yeah. shall I do that? Hold on, let's just okay. move it on. Okay, shared resources. Well, we are coming to the end, obviously. But um, we've had some good ones in recently, including Rosa S. Rosa's great at sending things in. I'm sure, I don't know if she's here today. Rosa, if you are. Um, so she sent in, I know it's literature resources, but obviously this is our last one, so I'm mentioning yeah. them now. Some really um, MCQ sheets for Christmas Carol, Romeo and Juliet. And then Sarah sent in poetry resources for comparing poppies and expo exposure, preparation for a comparison essay and lots of other things like that. So that was another good one about comparing. I mean, you know, I'm sure there's other ones out there for other comparison essays, but that was really good and useful as well. And, oh, MCQ is multiple choice questions, Sam. I know I didn't know that either until recently. That's right. It is, yeah. It? And they, again, they, they, they're something I would, that I've done a lot of work on, actually. And I did mention in a previous webinar. So it's worth looking back. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Because multi choice questions can be way more than just, you know, what colour shirt was he wearing? Multi choice yeah. questions can be a really good way of, use, they can be used for assessments quite successfully, actually. 
That's it, yeah. And that was what we talked about with, I think it was Kat Howard or Chris or somebody and yourself. And if you go back to our, if you look on the um, slide that's there now at the bottom, you can see it says English GCSE webinar resource page. For those of you who didn't know about this before, when you when you get your PowerPoint slides after this event, you can click on that and you'll find our previous webinars. They're not all up there yet. It takes a while for them to come through to us and then we put them on there. I think we're on number nine or yeah. ten at the minute. But yeah, if you you'll see how useful the mcqs are for like you say assessing what people know as well at a certain point in the text or whatever so yeah it's really good so that's it um let's just move on to the next one now we normally do our fortnightly shared resource draw so i'm going to do that now and let's have i can just tell you now actually that the winner of this one so if you're in the room if you well you know what i mean in the virtual room if you can just make yourself known in the group chat the winner today is Sarah S because uh, she sent in quite a few things. Uh, she sent in the poetry thing, which was good. And I thought that was really good. So she's the winner of the £25 shared resource voucher from Amazon resource voucher. So I'm waffling. Yeah, you're the winner of the resource. Oh, you're there. Good. Thank you. Well done. Sarah. So I will send that to you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. And moving on. The weekly draw for the feedback survey, which I have here, as you know, my trusty cup. The winner is Helena F. Is Helena in the room? With the £10 voucher. I think she is. I'm oh, sure I've seen oh. Helena F. I've seen that name. Definitely, I'm sure Come on, she's Helena, here. are you in the room? Let's have a look. Oh, I thought, she, I thought I saw her earlier on as well. Maybe she's gone. Maybe she fell out of the internet or something. But yeah, so she'll get the £10 voucher. Lovely. Thanks very much, Pam. That's it. So thank you so much for sending all the resources you've sent in over the last few weeks. It's been great, Julie, hasn't it? Fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. And if I can just say quickly, um, if you look on that slide now, you'll see that um, I decided, well, I thought I'd do a podcast a few, well, just before lockdown, and it's finally got around, I finally got around to being able to do it. So the first one is there, and it's episode one is with Kat Howard, and it's quite good in terms of, you know, we did quite deep into a lot of things such as work life balance, imposter syndrome, you know, whole class feedback, marking, etc., etc., relationships in schools. It's quite long, it's on for 50 minutes. But a few people who've already listened to it have said they found it useful. So please have a look at that when you get a chance. It's also going to be on uh, Spotify and Apple. And uh, we've got a page dedicated it, to it now. And there's another one coming up as well. So if you can follow the podcast, that'd be great. And we'll keep those coming. And if you want to email me with anyone you think you'd like to hear as a guest on the podcast, that'd be great too. So yeah, that'd be brilliant. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. So back to what more can we do to help? Um, I know that all of you have really appreciated the help that Edexcel have given over the lockdown period, and I'm really pleased we were able to do that. Actually, I'm really proud of what we've what, of what we've produced and pulled together. Actually, it's you know it, it's been great working with the team, and I'm I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity. But in terms of the support over the summer, getting you ready for September, it's all there. If you need to know the government update, there's the link there. You'll find all the information there. Um, online as well. We did run a series of free online lessons for Year 10 students, and they are still available. And even if you only want the PowerPoint, you can get it from following that link. And they take you through language. They're really, really good. Okay, so they're really worth looking at. Um, knowledge organisers for our new texts, because don't forget we have got um, the four new texts and the um, poetry, the new belongings collection as well. Um, off, on, follow that link. So if you're teaching those texts for the first time or you just want an overview of them, it's really worth just downloading those um, those knowledge organisers and just reading up and seeing if, if, if they take your fancy. PowerPoint lessons. We've got live live PowerPoint lessons for all of those areas. Now, what that involves, if you haven't looked at one, is you could direct your students to watch, watch them and it takes them through how to write an exam answer for any of those texts, okay? And it, but if you want to look at them, it will also give you some tips on how to, there's some good homework ideas, etc. on there. But you could actually set that as a homework. They last about, they're about half an hour long, but if you set it for students, they can pause it and do the activities and then carry on. So it takes longer than that for them. Um, secondary resources, there's the page. And then there's Claire, who's always there in the background for us and is your first point of contact, really, for anything to do with English. And then if you have been inspired to find out more about us and you aren't with us already, there's the link. 
and then I'm going to end on the feedback. Now, I really, really want you all to do the feedback today. We are, I'm pretty sure, going to be back in September. It's still, it's still um, up in the air exactly what's going to be provided, but we are going to be back. Look out for an email with dates for the next one. And if you've got any ideas, please email to Pam on that full English email address and say, I'd like this, I'd like that, or I'd like to see this person because, you know, we need ideas. And I hope you appreciate that we respond to every bit of feedback. So if you tell us now on the feedback, that will give us something to work on over the summer. Okay, so I'd just like to end by saying thank you very much to it, very much to everybody. I can't get my words out now. Thank you very much. To yeah, no, I'm not crying. I am a bit emotional. It's been, a, I've done 13 of these and it's, it's just been fab. I've really enjoyed it. It's kept me going through some quite sort of tough and dark times here in lockdown. And it's been something to look forward to every week. And I've really, really appreciated the feedback. And I've enjoyed making all the resources and, and having such, um, you know, good dialogue on here with you all. So um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I mean, we can see by looking at these comments, so just on behalf of everyone, I just want to say a massive, massive thank you to Julie and also to Pam. Um, you've worked brilliantly together. Your dedication and your enthusiasm to turn around this content, the resources and the slides on a weekly basis for 13 weeks is no mean feat. So. Don't underestimate that. You've done absolutely amazingly well. And, and just look at these comments. Everyone really appreciates it. Um, and these sessions have been really enjoyable. So thank you so much. Um, and I must also mention our network team. Sam Hughes is here and Mike. Um, without them, these sessions wouldn't happen. Um, lots goes on in the background. Um, so they're working tirelessly as well, organizing these events every week as are our colleagues from Streamlines, John Paul and Nikki. Thank you very much for your help with all the technical issues. Um, and most of all, thank you to all of you all of you for coming. Obviously, without you here, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, and it has been really nice chatting with you all. So thank you. And as Julie said, we will be back in the autumn term said, to support I'll you. I'll be back. Um, I'll be back. As and how. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Have a lovely summer. Um, and yeah, we'll see you in the autumn. And now I need to head over to Pam, who wants to um, start a sing-along. <laughs> right, okay, on. so we're going to sing along now. So if you disappear, I don't blame you, but we're going to start. Ready? I did want to have the words on the screen bouncing along, but I don't think yeah, we're allowed no to do that. Words, no, 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 right. we're going to sing it. We all know the words. Ready? So we're going to sing, we're all going on a summer holiday from Cliff Richards. So I'm going to count us in. <laughs> Two, one... We're all going on a summer holiday. No more working for a week or two. Fun and laughter summer on a holiday. summer holiday. No more worries for me and you are for a week or two. Is anybody else singing out there? I think they are. Thank you, Pam. And okay, thank you. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, John Paul. Thanks, Sam. I really miss you there in the background. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Julie. Brilliant. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.